Good afternoon, everybody. As usual, I don't expect anyone to show up, but I'm going to go ahead and lecture on chapter 27. This is our last lecture for the semester. Next week, we'll be doing a review in lab. Um, I will hop on briefly again here in case somebody has some more questions. But um, let's go ahead and get started. Chapter 27. Okay, we're talking about reproduction and development. Sex determination. So what determines sex or gender? Gonads. It turns out the gonads are not just uh, for men. Gonads in incorporate both the testicles and the ovaries. So males produce sperm cells and females produce ova. Eggs is the common term, but it's better to say ova or ovule rather than an egg. I'll probably say egg a few times. And it's chromosomes that determine chromosomal gender. Now, there's lots of things that have to do with gender, transgender, or uh, genitalia-based gender, but for human beings, it's the chromosomes that determine gender primarily. So the chromosomes that don't determine gender, have nothing to do with um, gender, are called autosomes. They're the non-sex chromosomes. There's 22 pairs, and then the sex chromosomes. So if you notice that 23 is the total number of pairs, and that's where 23andMe, the company that will check your genes, uh, comes from because there's 23 pairs in most humans. So 23 pairs and 46 total chromosomes. So there's sex chromosomes and then autosomes. Okay, sex chromosomes. Females normally have the 2X chromosome uh, combination. One is inherited from mother and one from father. Father has an X and a Y. Mom has two Xs. Males inherit one X from the mother and the Y from the father. Now, interestingly, the Y, all the Y does is, to, is turn the baby into a boy, but the X has lots of characteristics on it that have nothing to do with uh, gender. There's a lot of characteristics on there that are not gender related. Fathers determine the gender of the offspring. This is a little bit of a wonky thing. What it means is whatever sperm cell arrives, if it's carrying a Y chromosome, baby becomes a boy. And if it's an X, it becomes a girl. But it just basically is, is random which sperm cell is going to be drawn into the ovum uh, during fertilization. Abnormal combinations, uh, this is, uh, it becomes female, sometimes called super female. Uh, two X's and a Y is male because any presence of a Y converts the baby into a boy. X blank is, uh, I can't remember the name of the disorder off the top of my head, but blank Y dies. And the idea behind this is you have to have at least one X chromosome to survive because, as I said, there's a lot of genes on the X chromosome that have nothing to do with gender. There are things like how your blood is built and, and things like how your eyes are built. So there we go. Sex-linked traits. And we're going to get into some of these uh, some of these genes that are on the X chromosome. So most human traits are located on autosomes, having nothing to do with X or Y. That's most of who we are. Humans are diploid, which means they have two genes for a single trait because you got to full set of genes, chromosomes from your mom, and you got a full set from your dad. So for example, you have two genes for eye color, big B, little b, uh, gives you brown eyes, and two recessive genes gives you blue eyes. If you've had any genetics, you would be, this would be familiar. Many traits are located on the X chromosome. Males have no second gene for sex-linked traits. So the idea is that women have two Xs. So for example, if they have a dominant on one X and a recessive on the other X, the dominant will show and the recessive will hide. Whereas if a male has a recessive on his X, there's no other chromosome to cover it. So that will automatically show. And that's why males show it so much more often than females. Things like color blindness and uh, sickle, uh, not sickle cell, but um, hemophilia. If a male has one copy of a recessive gene, it will always show since he has no other gene to mask it because we as men only have one X. Ladies, you have two Xs. Females have a chance to mask a sex-linked trait with their second X chromosome. So the chances that she will show it are much lower because most of these uh, recessives that are problems are rare. And so if a woman gets one, it doesn't show up. If a man gets one, it always shows up because he has no way to cover it. Females show uh, sex-linked traits half and often, as often as do men. Well, that's not exactly true. And the, the reason why I say this is because it's more like, what is the difference between X and X squared? So for example, if X is 10, X squared is 100, that's not twice as much, that's exponentially more. So this statement half 
is not really true. It's more like exponentially less. That would be the better answer there, but stick with this for the sake of the test. I just want you to know that it's exponentially less, not half, okay? Example of sex-linked traits are male pattern baldness, hemophilia, which is a blood clotting disorder, and a color blindness, red, green, color blindness. Okay, fetal development. Reproductive structures begin to develop at about the seventh week of fetal development. So when a baby is inside uh, the mom, their reproductive structures start to develop inside of mom. Um, don't worry about this. This is not going to be on the test. You can just skip that. Pseudohermaphrodism, I was, would talk about if there's someone here and interested, but skip that. It will not be extra credit. Sorry about that. In the absence of male hormones, external genitalia appear female. So here's the idea. All babies are female unless there's a Y chromosome, chromosome there that converts that baby, normal female baby, into a boy. So what's interesting genetically is boys are highly modified females. So it's the absence of the Y that makes someone into a female. And when the Y is present, the baby becomes a boy. So that's interesting there. Gametes, uh, ova or oocytes, those are the two proper terms for what we would call eggs, are the largest cells in the human body. Question, why do they need to be so big? Because when the sperm fertilizes it, that being, that zygote, that ball of cells gets no nutrition from mom until after it implants in the uterus. And it has to travel all the way down the fallopian tube or oviduct uh, before it can implant. So it has to have all the material it needs to undergo all this cell division and all this growth. Uh, and that's why it's so large. It's, 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 uh, it has to have all that nutrition in it and volume in it so it can go undergo several cell divisions without any help. They over contain all the organelles that are found in the developing zygote. Here's another interesting fact. If you've ever studied any general biology, you know that there's mitochondria, there's Golgi bodies, there's all kinds of organelles in, inside of your cells. Those are all copies of your mom's. The only thing you got from your dad was chromosomes. So all of the cells in my body are copies of my mom's cell with DNA from my dad. Okay, so all the organelles found in the developing zygote come from mom's cells because dad's Sperm only delivers chromosomes, no organelles. Ova contain all the food necessary for the beginning of development. That's all the way from the release at the ovary until implantation in the uterus. Sperm cells are much smaller containing chromosomes only. So the idea is they get really small because they have to swim upstream against the flow of uterine and abdominal fluid is really what it is, coming from the abdom abdomen through the fallopian tube. So the sperm have to swim upstream. It's very much like salmon swimming upstream to spawn. It's kind of an interesting analogy. Sperm cells have flagella for swimming to the ovum during fertilization. So not only are they going from their deposition in the vagina through the cervix in through the uterus and up through the oviduct, but they're also going against a current that is generated by cilia inside the fallopian tube or oviduct. Gamete production. Women are born with all the ova they will ever have. So ladies, you don't get any more ova after you're born. They're there. So what's interesting is all the ova inside of a woman um, were exposed to all the things that her mom was. So here's the interesting idea is that whatever, ladies, whatever your mom did while she was pregnant with you affected your ova or eggs, and that affects your children. So in reality, if you think about it, what your mom did affected her grandchildren because those ova were still in you while you were in her. Kind of an interesting side note. Women released over between the ages of 12 and 50. This is the beginning of menstruation and this is, uh, and this is menopause. So most women have uh, periods between this uh, time. Some women start earlier, some women in later or vice versa. After that time, no more ova are released or menstrual cycles occur, and this is menopause. This often happens around the age of 50 for most women. Males produce sperm continuously from beginning of sex, sexual maturate, uh, maturity, which is about 13, 14, 15 for most guys, until death. So this is another interesting difference. So even though sperm production diminishes as we get past 30, it never completely tails off. For example, Charlie Chaplin, old silent movie star, was a brand new father at age 70. So even 70 year old, 80 year old men, if they can have an orgasm, that semen still has sperm cells in it. Whereas women past the age of 50, 55 or 60 generally don't. So that's the difference in the genders. Is that fair? Who knows? Some decline in numbers at later ages. This is usually correlated with a drop in testosterone levels um, associated with aging. 
gametogenesis, the term means gamete genesis or the creation of new gametes. It's the development of gametes. Males produce sperm through continuous meiotic divisions. My, meiotic means meiosis. A meiosis is the process whereby we take cells, cut the total chromosomes in half from 2N, which is called diploid, to 1N, which is called haploid. Now, why do we have to cut our number of chromosomes in half? Well, how many parents does it take to make a baby? Two. So I can only give half of my chromosomes to my kid. Baby mama, wife, whatever, uh, she gives half as well. And so you end up with a full set of baby. And that's how sexual reproduction works. I can't give all of my chromosomes to my kid because they would end up with double what they're supposed to have and that wouldn't work. In female ova, the first stages of meiosis begin during puberty, but do not complete until fertilization. So here's another interesting factoid. Ladies, if you've never ever been pregnant, you've never once completed meiosis. Meiosis only completes after a sperm cell arrives and fertilization initiates. Males do it millions of times a day, producing millions and billions of sperm throughout their lifetime. Every 28 days, approximately an ovum is released, and that's called ovulation. Interestingly, 28 days does not correspond to calendar months. Instead, it does correspond to another cycle, which is, anybody know? It is the lunar cycle. So it turns out the lunar cycle and uh, the reproductive cycle in women is pretty similar. If no sperm are present, meiosis is not completed. So no sperm, no meiosis completion. It starts, but then it just goes into suspended animation. Okay, so this is a figure that's not from your current textbook, but it does show how spermatogonia, which are the um, stem cells that give rise to sperm cells, undergo division uh, through mitosis. This is just multiplying the total number of cells. And then meiosis cuts it in, in half. So you can see you go from two chromosomes in there to a single chromosome, and then eventually the spermatids, which are tailless cells, develop into individual sperm cells. And then when they get deposited inside the female body, they start swimming and can become dad. Now, in, in female reproduction, it's a little bit different. Uh, while there is uh, mitosis giving you what is called primary oocyte, the idea is that the cell physically doesn't divide after that because it has to stay large. What happens is these polar bodies are chunks of DNA that end up being pushed off to the side because they're not going to end up inside the baby. Eventually, polar bodies move off to the side and are disintegrated, and eventually a second polar body disintegrates. Now you have a haploid half chromosome total number of cell, and a sperm cell comes in, and you got a zygote. Now it has two chromosomes, or the total of 46, 23 pairs. That's a baby. Control of reproduction. Hormones that control reproduction are produced in the brain. So the brain actually controls reproduction, not the gametes, or not the, uh, not the gonads. Gonadotropin releasing hormone. We did talk about a little bit about hormones earlier in the semester. This is called GRH. Produced by the hypothalamus, which sits right on the underside of our brain, causes the anterior pituitary to release secondary hormones. Now, if you remember how hormones work, the hypothalamus sends a signal to the pituitary. The pituitary releases hormones that control all of our other glands. In this case, it would be your reproductive glands, testicles and ovaries. So follicle-stimulating hormone is one of those secondary sex hormones. FSH controls gametogenesis along with the sex hormones. So in addition to testosterone and estrogen, FSH kind of controls how quickly um, sperm are going to be produced or ova are going to be released. Luteinizing hormone is another hormone that stimulates the gonads to produce sex hormones. So this is coming from the pituitary. It tells the gonads, hey, produce androgens or estrogens, depending on the gender. More about sex hormones. Androgens and estrogens are produced in both sexes due to luteinizing hormones. So Males have some estrogens, females have some androgens, testosterone-like hormones. Androgens such as testosterone predominate in males and high levels can lead to male pattern baldness and certain types of male, male aggression. Now, for example, uh, you can't automatically say high levels of testosterone are gonna lead to male aggression, but they have found that when males have their testicles removed for whatever reason, the aggression levels diminished and high levels tend to lead towards male pattern baldness, but that also requires a gene, so it's more complicated. Estrogens predominate in females, and can high levels can lead to ovarian cancer, especially when estrogens are introduced postmenopausally when the body is anticipating a drop in that. If you add it in after menopause, it can lead to ovarian and other types of reproductive cancers. 
So this shows you how uh, this works anatomically. So there's a testicle. If you take one of the tubes that's coiled up inside there and cut across, uh, across the midsection there, this is the inside of the tube. This is what it looks like under a scanning electron microscope. And this is what it looks like diagrammatically. So if we look at the wall of the uh, seminiferous tubule, is what it's called, then you can see these cells are undergoing meiosis, mitosis, meiosis, and becoming spermatids. These cells are called spermatids. Eventually, they lose most of their cytoplasm and most of their nucleus. And they're really left with these little tiny, what are kind of like torpedoes. They're carrying a payload of just chromosomes. They have a little bit of energy. They have the ability to swim. But pretty much, they're just a little package of chromosomes. OK, male, male reproduction. What is the pathway of sperm cells? Well, they start in the seminiferous tubules, which I just showed you. The development of sperm cells, this is about 80% of the testing. So it turns out that if you have really large testicles, you have more seminiferous tubules, and you're producing more sperm, everything else being equal. So men being pre uh, preoccupied with their testicle size in terms of their reproductive prowess may not be completely unfounded. The epididymis is the outside of the testes that storms sperm cells. The vas deferens conducts sperm cells out of the testes. And the urethra is the pathway of semen to the environment. I'm going to stop share for just a moment here. And I'll be right back. OK, I'm back. Here we were. Okay, so we were talking about this, off we go. This is more of what I was showing you, the spermatogonia, which are here. Divide through mitosis, produce immature sperm cells, which are the spermatids. So spermatogonia go through mitosis to become spermatids. Then the spermatids here divide through meiosis to produce the sperm cells. Uh, and the Sertoli cells are supporting cells. Sperm cells mature in the lumen wall of the seminiferous tubule. So these spermatids undergo meiosis, they become spermatozoa, which are basically sperm cells. Sertoli cells support and nourish the developing sperm. Okay, taking a look at a sperm cell. During development of sperm cells, they lose most of their cytoplasm and organelles. They need to be light because they're swimming. And the one that can swim the fastest usually becomes dad, sperm cell. So being small and light helps them. And that's part of the reason why the Y chromosome is so small is because all the extra genes in there that aren't important in converting the baby into a boy were lost over millennia as they were racing. These sperm cells were racing to get there. And the ones that had slightly smaller Y chromosomes got there first. And so there was a selective pressure to make the Y chromosome smaller. But as you can see, this looks very much like a uh, armor piercing shell of a, of a uh, tank or a uh, or a torpedo, and that's really kind of how it works. They develop a flagella for motility, which is their ability to swim upstream towards the, um, uh, through the oviduct to the ovum, which is on its way down from the, uh, from the, uh, the structure, the uh, ovum, that uh, the ovary, excuse me, sorry folks, the ovary that uh, is releasing. The head of the sperm contains the nucleus, which has the chromosomes inside of it, tightly packed. The acrosome on the surface has uh, enzymes that dissolve the outermost layer of the ovum. There's an area called the zona uh, pellucida and the corona radiata. Both have to be dissolved by the acrosome before the uh, sperm nucleus or sperm, uh, the head of the sperm cell, can be drawn into the ovum. The midpiece contains contractile microtubules and large numbers of mitochondria for ATP production. So there's the mitochondria spiral. These microtubules flex to allow it to swim. Sperm, smells, excuse me, sperm cells must develop at a temperature slightly below 98 degrees or they will not be able to swim. And that's one of the reasons why men back in the day that used to wear really tight jeans had problems with their sperm cell counts because sperm don't want to develop on the inside. If they want to develop on the inside, testicles would be on the inside of the male's body. But because they're on the outside, they need to be slightly cooler. So on cold days, the testicles move closer to the body. On really warm days, they move further away. And that's one of the ways to tell how hot or cold it is out there. If a man was naked, he'd be hanging low or up against the uh, up against the body. All right, production of semen. Semen is composed of sperm cells and other fluids. Now, interestingly, semen, which is what comes out of a man during ejaculation, is not e mostly sperm cells. It's not even 
the, the sperm cell count uh, proportion is very, very tiny amount of the total semen. So there you go, 99% of semen is accessory fluids added to sperm cells during ejaculation. So when a man has had a vas vasectomy, which I have had, the volume of semen is not really measurably different because it's only 1% sperm cells. So the idea is semen is mostly not sperm cells, it's other material. What are the accessory glands? Coming up on the next slide. So this is a great figure showing you uh, the different uh, accessory glands uh, on the right. What do they do? And then what do they make? So uh, the component is sperm. The function is being the gamete. And where do you get them from? So it's kind of reading right to left. But you can see all the different things that go into making semen. Uh, interestingly, fructose is the, is the sugar that drives it, not glucose. Glucose is the main sugar that our bodies produce or that our bodies use for energy. And yet fructose is what sperm cells prefer, which is fruit sugar. Uh, buffers are there to neutralize the acidic environment of the vagina. Mucus is a lubricant. The mucus is really there to hold the, the semen up against the cervical uh, opening so that the sperm cell can travel, travel through before the semen dr drains out of the female's body. Okay, male infertility. Infertility we can do to, due to problems with either the man or the woman. Male infertility is usually due to low sperm count. Fewer sperm cells means less chance that they're going to make it all the way to the ovum. Or abnormally produced sperm cells, which can happen as a variety of some disorders. It can be abnormalities in the conduction of sperm. So for example, the tubes leading from the testicles all the way out through the urethra, there can be blockage due to disease or physical damage, injuries, et cetera. So what could cause this? certain diseases can cause problems with um, pathways or the production of sperm cells, drugs or chemotherapy. Remember, those are going to be killing any rapidly dividing cells, and sperm cells come from rapidly developing spermatogonia, so they would be killed. Genetic problems associated with uh, fertility and tight clothing. So we mentioned tight clothing, right? If you press the testicles up against the body, it's going to make the temperature of the sperm cells rise up to 98 per, uh, degrees or higher and reduce sperm numbers. Okay, part two. Now, if you have another set of notes, pause it here, get out your second set of notes, and we're going to keep going. here. Female reproductive anatomy. So on to female now. O ovaries produce ova and hormones, just like the, the males do. Although there are about 7 million oogonia, which are cells that can develop in the ovum, only 300 to 500 are ever released. And you just do the math. Every 28 days between the ages of 12 and 50, you get right around that number. Oocytes, which we would sometimes call eggs, are contained in a primary follicle inside the ovaries. So we're going to see this term follicle, which kind of has got a similar fear to the feel to the follicles of our hair. The follicles contain a hair root, and here the follicles contain an ovum, oocyte. When the ova are released, they move into the oviducts. Basically, really, they move into the abdomen and then are drawn into the oviducts through the fimbrae of the um, opening of the oviducts and they eventually make their way down into the oviducts where they're fertilized fairly soon after uh, getting in there if everything goes as planned. Menstrual cycles. Women release ova once every 28 days, approximately. It varies from woman to woman. The menstrual cycle is broken down into two main parts. The first is called the ovarian cycle. That is what's happening with the ovaries. And the second is the uterine cycle, which is what is happening with the uterus. And they're not exactly on the same same cycle. And I'll explain why that is here coming up in a moment. The ovarian cycle. What happens in the ovaries? The ovarian cycle, now that we've broken it down into two parts, this is the ovarian cycle. The first part can be broken down into three distinct phases. The first is called the follicular phase, as in the follicle. It's 10 days to three weeks of development of the follicle. And this happens directly after the last ovulation. This is the first step right after the previous ovulation. Ovulation occurs when the follicle has ripened and ovum is released. So that's part two. And then the luteal phase is named for the transformation of the follicle into the corpus luteum. This corpus luteum is what's going to be guiding the first stage of the pregnancy before the placenta can take over and the woman's body can take over. So the luteal phase happens after ovulation, and then out right after the luteal phase, the follicular phase starts again. Sorry, folks, I have a plumbing problem happening right now in my house, so I'm dealing with that. Let me go ahead and restart that um, restart that lecture for you. Okay, here we were. Okay, so we were we're talking about the different phases of the ovarian cycle. 
Corpus luteum secretes hormones that continue preparation for pregnancy. This happens until the placenta of the baby takes over, believe it or not. Okay, so this shows you some of the anatomy here of the female reproductive tract. Myometrium is the muscular portion of the uh, uterus. But here you see the different stages here, primary follicles becoming secondary follicles. This is through the ovarian cycle. Then you have a mature follicle, the mature follicle ruptures, releasing the oocyte or egg. Then that ruptured follicle becomes the corpus luteum, which is going to guide the potential pregnancy if there's, uh, if there's uh, sperm cells there and if you do have successful fertilization. And then the regressing corpus luteum occurs after the um, after the placenta takes over and starts producing the hormones that the corpus luteum would at this point. Now to the uterine cycle, which is the other main portion of it. The uterine cycle can be broken down into its three phases. So you should know each of the three phases. Menses, now interestingly, they started with the shedding of the endometrium from the previous cycle. But with any cycle, you can always start anywhere. It just, there's a sequence. So for example, you know, fall is not the first, the first, uh, the first season because there's always one right before it. So this is a random spot to start it. The menses or menstruation is the shedding of the endometrium from the previous cycle, which is menstrual bleeding. Immediately following that, proliferation is where it starts to grow again. It's characterized, characterized by thickening of the endometrial wall. So this is the second stage. And the last stage is called the secretory phase. This happens after ovulation in anticipation of fertiliza uh, fertilization and implantation of the fetus. Hormones from the corpus luteum, as I said, convert the thickened endometrium into a secretory structure in anticipation of pregnancy. So if sexual intercourse happens or other form of fertilization, then all of these are going to be working together to prepare the female's body for the arrival of a, of a little baby. All right. So this is an interesting figure showing what's happening at these different stages. So we have hormone levels, gonadotropic hormone levels. Remember, these are hormones that are going to be heading towards the gonads, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. Now, I may be asking you some questions about this figure. Now, if I ask the question, do both FSH and LH, when do they max out? When do they spike? The answer is right at ovulation. So please note, this dotted line is ovulation. So notice FSH and LH both spike right on the same day as ovulation. So you can see the ovarian cycle, we have follicular phase, ovulation, and luteal phase, but here's where it gets a little bit more complicated. The ovarian hormone levels, those that are produced by the ovaries, don't always peak right at ovulation. So for example, estrogen rises up before that, several days before. The only one that spikes right at the same time as ovulation is inhibited. Now, progesterone, which is going to be supporting pregnancy, peaks far after because it takes a while for the fertilized ovum to make it to the, to the uterus. Here's another thing that's a little bit different. The endometrial wall is not the thickest right at ovulation, again, because ovulation is gonna be way in advance of when the fetus arrives, embryo arrives. And so by the time it arrives, way over here, it is at its thickest. So I might ask the question. The last one is, does a woman's body temperature rise or fall on the day of ovulation? Well, most women believe it rises. But if you look at this actual figure here, you can see right on the day of ovulation, it actually goes down a little bit and then rises afterwards. So there's actually a slight drop in temperature and then a rise after, afterwards. So I may be asking you questions about this figure. Make sure that you know if I say, ask some, something about this figure, you can answer the questions based on what I just told you about. I don't believe this figure will be unfilled out like this, but if it is unfilled out, use the filled out one to help you answer the questions. Hormones associated with the ovarian and uterine cycles. Okay, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GRH, is produced by the hypothalamus. Follicle-stimulating, FSH, and luteinizing hormone are released from the anterior pituitary. So if you remember, GRH is produced by the hypothalamus. It goes to the pituitary gland. It tells the pituitary gland to release these two. These two are going to go then to the ovaries and cause estrogen, progesterone, and inhibin to be produced. So you can see the step one then to the pituitary, and then to the ovaries. Androgens, breast development during puberty is due to estrogen. So that's why little girls started to develop breasts is because andro uh, excuse me, estrogen is starting to be produced at about that time. Pubic and axillary or armpit hair, sexual drive in women are due to adrenal androgens. So interestingly, sex drive in women 
and the hair that starts to develop there are due to hormones normally associated with men. That's a review question and potentially a test question. Contraceptives. 80% of unprotected sex results in unplanned pregnancy within one year. That's a very specific number. I don't know if I buy that. It came from the publishers, but um, it depends on what other things uh, that couples do to pr protect themselves from unwanted pregnancy. What are some different types of contraceptives? Well, absence is the most effective, but often hardest to maintain because people want to have sex. Barrier methods to prevent sperm from entering the uterus include condoms, diaphragms, and sponges. These are blocking the pathway of sperm to, to get from the uh, vagina into the uterus and eventually into the oviduct. Sterilization is the most effective for sexually active people, but it's not easily reversed. I got a vasectomy, can't really be reversed easily, so I'm done. Oral contraceptives are one of the most common ones. Uh, they suppress ovulation, prevent sperm cell penetration of the cervix. So interestingly, during normally, when one is not on oral contraceptives or what we call the pill, during uh, ovulation or just after ovulation, there's little channels through the mucus in the plug in the uh, cervix of the uterus. Now, uh, when the birth control pill is taken, those channels don't develop and there's no pathway for the sperm to get from the uh, distal end of the vagina in through the cervix into the uterus and then up into there. In addition, ovulation generally doesn't happen. So this is really effective in preventing uh, pregnancy. Contraceptive vaccines are in clinical trials in Sweden. We don't have them yet, uh, but uh, it would be a great way to be off of uh, these pills, uh, but they haven't been perfected yet. Female infertility can be due to mechanical problems. Mechanical problems mean not hormonal. Block fallopian tubes due to disease or um, injury or other structural problems that doesn't develop properly. Hormonal problems are the opposite, decreased or absent ovulation. Some women don't ovulate. Production of antibodies to sperm cells by the female. This is fairly logical, but not very good because it is an invading cell. And normally a woman's body does not attack and kill sperm cells, but if it does, then obviously a baby's not gonna be produced. Spontaneous termination of pregnancy, which we call miscarriage, occurs in up to 30% of all pregnancies, uh, depending on the individual woman. It happens sometimes. In vitro fertilization is what happens when uh, couples can't get pregnant normally. It's the artificial fertilization of many over by sperm outside the body and can often result in identical or fraternal twins because often they will implant several different ova. Uh, hopefully one of them will take. Probably of successful pregnancy is less than 25%. So often it's very frustrating for the couples that are trying to do it. Okay, one more time, folks. I, like I said, I've got issues. So I'm gonna go ahead and share this again, go back to it again and just skip right past it. Okay, what is capacitation? Okay, when over release from the ovaries, they're swept into the fallopian tube. Capacitation is the final maturation step of the sperm and occurs in the vagina. So the idea is the sperm cells are developed, but they're not really ready to be daddy sperm cells until they actually enter the acidic environment of the vagina. What happens is the molecules on the head of the sperm cell reorganize, allowing them to swim quickly and fertilize the ovum. So basically it's kind of like arming a torpedo. You arm a torpedo and then you fire it and then it can go off and do its thing. But normally that doesn't happen inside the ship that's carrying the torpedo, and that's kind of how it works. Sperm cells inside of men aren't really ready to fertilize an egg or an ovum until they make it into the, into the vagina. In vitro fertilization requires artificial capacitation of sperm cells. So the idea is you have to trick the sperm cells to, into thinking they are inside the female body, and that way they kind of turn on themselves on, reorganizing the head and making themselves ready to fertilize the ovum. Fertilization. That's when uh, the sperm cells, you can see, start attacking the corona radiata, the outermost layer of the ovum or egg. It happens in the distal portion of the fallopian tube closest to the uh, ovaries. And the reason why that's so important is because once fertilization occurs, there have to be several different days of cell, cell division and development before it arrives at the uh, uterus. Because if fertilization happens right when it's at the uterus, it's going to be swept outside the woman's body before the the, the embryo has fully developed enough to implant. So a successful pregnancy, fertilization occurs right up near the, uh, 
the ovary. So the sperm have to actually be swimming on their way before the ovum is released. It's kind of like a timing thing. And that's why couples that are trying to have babies will have sex a lot at that period so that the sperm cells are always there for when the ovum is, heads its way down. Only 100 of the millions of the jacular sperm reach the ovum. Again, a very specific number that's not necessarily the case. The idea is a small number will arrive. And it turns out that actually some of the sperm cells stay behind in the oviduct to block any other, believe it or not, any other man's sperm cells coming up. The act is kind of like blockers. So only the first man's sperm cells will make it all the way to the end. Sperm cells must penetrate the outer layers of the ovum, which is the corona radiata and zona pellucida. You can see the zona is a kind of a clear layer around it. And the uh, corona radiata is a whole bunch of cells. They have to kind of chip away at that until they can get to the surface of the egg and be drawn in. Enzymes in the head of the sperm cell dissolve the outermost layer. Okay, fertilization itself, which is called fusion. Fer the first sperm cell dissolves the outermost layer of the ovum, fuses with the ovum cell membrane. You can see the fusion here. The fusion of sperm and ovum initiates resumption of meiosis. So as soon as fusion happens, the uh, meiosis completes. They're actually kind of mi mixing these two stages here. Normally, as, as soon as fusion happens, meiosis starts, but meiosis finishes as soon as the sperm nucleus is drawn, drawn in. Excuse me. Then the sperm nucleus and the remaining chromosomes from meiosis fuse together to form the zygote, and then the polar body leaves, gets basically pushed off to the side and destroyed. The nuclei fuse and the zygote is formed, going from haploid now to diploid. This is now a fetus or embryo. It's actually called the zygote, the first cell that was all of our day one name when we were conceived. I may ask you questions about what's happening in these different stages, but I'm not sure. So make sure you know what each of these stages is. This is an interesting figure that's not from your text, but it does show you what's happening day by day. The release of the ovum on day one, fertilization also in day one. So notice as soon as it comes into the oviduct, these are called the fimbrae, which are the outermost layers of the tube. Sperm cells arrive right when it enters the tube. Fertilization occurs. The zygote starts to divide, 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 and doesn't actually make it down into the uterus until between days five and nine. By then, notice that there's a whole bunch of little cells, a little hollow spot has formed, and then eventually it'll be drawn into the uterine wall where mother starts to produce, it starts to provide nutrients to this developing embryo. But for this entire time, from the time it's released all the way until it makes it to implantation, all of the nutrients in there came from this original egg. Okay, folks, I got to go. I got some issues happening. So we're going to finish part three next week when we do our review for the final. Uh, you can finish filling this in um, with your PowerPoint, but I'm going to lecture on it next week. Uh, have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you next time.